So good morning, everyone. We're, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you very much for joining. I'm Jennifer Bachner. I direct the government or the uh, government analytics program here at uh, Johns Hopkins University. This is a relatively new master's degree program that's focused on providing students with the skills they need to be leaders in the data revolution and to be data-driven decision makers in the public sector. Uh, we offer this breakfast series about every other month with REI Systems, and the purpose is to bring together professionals, um, academics, um, and people in government and industry to discuss different ways in which analytics are being used in the public sector. We very much encourage your input, um, both during and after the presentation. Um, and uh, along those lines, I want to extend a welcome to those of you joining us by the live stream and you are encouraged to participate as well. There should be an area where you can enter in questions right below the video stream. So please enter your uh, questions. We'd love to hear from you as well. Um, if you're so inclined, you can tweet about the event using the hashtag GabForum. Um, and there will be a recording of the event that will be posted on both the REI Systems and the Johns Hopkins website about 24 to 48 hours after the event, so you can re-watch it if there's something you missed or you can circulate it to um, among your colleagues. Um, thanks again for taking time out of your day to participate. Please enjoy the breakfast, which I assume you already have, but feel free to get seconds. And that's it. I'll turn the program over to Jeff Myers now of REI Systems. Thanks, Jen. Uh, REI is really pleased to co-host this with uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, we think at its, crux, at, it, at its root, what we'd like to do is establish a community that uh, uh, allows folks to kind of confer with each other to help uh, raise ideas, discuss ideas, and solve problems in analytics, uh, particularly, of course, in the government sector. Um, so we think that not only uh, is this an opportunity for you to chat with the folks who may be here in the room with you today, but also uh, over a period of time to get to know folks who, again, can help you solve your problems and perhaps you can help them solve their problems. Um, I want to uh, introduce REI just briefly. Uh, we are a, a company that does a lot with open government. So for example, we help develop the initial version of performance.gov as well as data.gov, IT dashboard.gov, USA Spending. Uh, we also do a lot of work with other federal government agencies in some of their mission programs. So we help uh, a number of agencies uh, such as uh, Health Resources and Services Administration make grants. Uh, we help uh, the Small Business Administration make SBIR, uh, I'm sorry, Small Business Innovation and Research Grants and Loans. Uh, we help the Office of the Comptroller of Currency manage its uh, uh, business programs as it audits banks around the country. Uh, and we have a deep interest in helping our clients work better with analytics and use the data that they have access to in more effective ways. Uh, we're pleased that, for example, within the last couple of weeks, one of our clients, Checkbook NYC, which is a transparency website for the city of New York, uh, was named one of Excellence.gov's uh, finalists for uh, uh, an Excellence in Government Award. Um, we also uh, just uh, uh, have begun helping the uh, General Services Administration uh, use analytics to evaluate and improve the implementation of FATARA, the Federal Information Technology Acquisition and Reform Act. Um, but let me uh, uh, cut off the conversation about REI and tell you I'm really pleased that uh, Lisa Danzig was able to join us. Uh, for those of you who don't know her, uh, Lisa has committed a, work, a career to working to serve the public sector and much of that has been at the federal level, although some of it has been at the state and local level as well. Uh, Lisa is currently the Chief Improve, uh, Performance Improvement Officer for the federal government. She serves at OMB as the Associate Director for per Performance and Personnel Management. Prior to that, she was the Performance Improvement Officer for the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and uh, she played the similar role heading the strategic planning and performance functions for the City of New York's housing agency, uh, working with Sean Donovan as he's made his way uh, from the state and local government to the federal government. Uh, Lisa's roles include, of course, uh, helping manage hippie pigs, which if you aren't familiar with them, they are high priority performance goals and helping ensure that both agencies are working towards the president's priorities and that they're actually making progress and improving them. And the reason that we thought it would be useful and interesting for her to contribute to this conversation and share with you kind of her experiences is because she has a kind of a unique government-wide perspective on where and how analytics can be used and how they can have an impact on improving government performance. Uh, so without further ado, let me invite Lisa Danzig to come and share with you kind of her perspectives. And I hope that you'll have good questions for her, whether it be from your own individual agency's perspective or from the government-wide perspective. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. Thanks, Dan. I was curious what hippie pigs was going to be. Um, I've heard that a while ago, but I'm like, I don't know where this is going to go. 
Um, thank you all for having me and for coming so early in the morning. Um, I thought I'd stay down here and we can have this be somewhat more of a discussion, so as you have any questions, certainly raise them. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a little bit of context on how I've gotten into this role and what my role is in, in, in analytics. Um, I think it's always challenging when someone says, oh, she's a government-wide perspective, and it's always hard given the size of our government, how do you actually have a perspective across the entirety of government? Um, so I look forward to your thoughts and feedback on a lot of this, since I think many of you are in this world and have good insights on this. Um, just a little bit of context on where I'm coming from. Um, before this role, I worked, as uh, Jeff said, at the City of New York and the Mayoral Housing Agency addressing affordable housing. John Donovan is actually the commissioner of that organization, so then he came to HUD and then he came to OMB, so I've had about eight years working with Sean, um, who is a very analytically driven uh, leader, and I've been incredibly fortunate to be kind of in this role in many of the organizations he's been in. Um, I led the strategic planning function there in New York City. Prior to that, I was a part of a consulting firm in New York City that focused on trying to use analytics for what I would think of as kind of the soft side of human capital or people issues. So I think a lot of people think about analytics and it makes an obvious sense to use it in terms of uh, logistical operations. How do you optimize emergency room visits or you know, how do you think about widgets and um, operational uh, analytic processes. But a lot of people don't apply it to preferences or kind of the psychological side of organizations and I was particularly interested in that. Um, my first task, for example, in that entity was um, using conjoint analysis. I don't know if I'm a show of hands who's familiar with conjoint analysis. A couple people again. <laughs> it was new to me and um, essentially has a hypothesis that um, you are not likely to get good information just asking people what they like, but that in fact revealed preferences are more indicative of what um, their preferences are. Probably like 101 of marketing um, for anyone who's trying to sell a product. So my first job when I went into that organization, into this consulting firm, was to try and put together a package of benefits for employees and then ask them through a kind of computer program, um, you know, would you prefer A, B, or C? And asking them multiple times, you get a kind of revealed preference about what they actually prefer. So many people might say, well, I prefer a silver car over red, but then when you package it together multiple times, they kind of reveal that they like red better. Um, <clears throat> so this revealed then a set of beliefs and priorities about what the employees really cared about in the organization so that the company could structure their benefits packages, time off, et cetera, in a way that prioritized what employees really cared about. So that's kind of an anecdote just of the kinds of things that I really find interesting in terms of how you use analytics to get to something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, to find out or to define and using it in an, in an environment or on a topic that um, otherwise isn't getting that kind of attention or analytic focus. Um, so prior to that, I was at business school. I thought business school would be the best training for thinking about analytics and thinking about how to apply this kind of rigor to what I think of as kind of mission outcomes or people type issues. Um, I think that was half true. <laughs> I got some grounding in that um, and certainly a broader perspective. Um, I spent a little bit of time at John Deere, which was, I think, an interesting uh, kind of contrast to some of the work that I'm doing now. I worked in the Compact Utility Tractor Group, um, you know, one of the oldest organizations that exists. They even have a color named after them, uh, John Deere Green. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and prior to that, I spent about six years in the uh, violence prevention world. So this is kind of what started me into um, how do you think about outcomes and how do you really measure outcomes? And it's an incredibly challenging field. It was actually youth violence prevention um, and how you think about whether or not you're actually reducing violence. So, you know, I think arrest rates or incidences of violence are always the things that people go to in trying to sort out, are we making progress here? But you look at poverty, you look at risk factors, violence prevention is such a complicated, challenging environment to operate in. Um, and so that was kind of my grounding as a community organizer, actually, in San Francisco, working with people on the street and thinking about how do we know if we're actually making progress here? How do we know if we're actually having an impact? So all of that to say that um, now I'm in a role that's very far from being on the streets of San Francisco, working with people who live in single room occupancy hotels, um, and in a role where I oversee performance for all of government um, in terms of our GIPRA implementation. I assume most people are pretty familiar with GIPRA. Show of hands on GIPRA. Yes, a <laughs> pretty educated audience. Um, also overseeing the personnel policy um, in collaboration with OPM. 
uh, in terms of defining uh, various policies that support our workforce, our federal workforce. And then I co-lead the customer service goal with Carolyn Colvin, the acting administrator of the Social Security Administration. Three huge mission kind of mandates for all of government that um, we have a very small team that uh, we're responsible for. So Jeff asked me to talk a little bit about analytics in terms of government. Um, and I thought what would be helpful is to talk about five different types of analytics that I've seen in the context, and since you're all familiar with GIPRA, we have our agency priority goals, our strategic reviews, um, and our cross-agency priority goals are kind of what I consider the three products of GIPRA. Um, and five different types, you could, I'm sure, categorize this in any number of ways. This is just the taxonomy that makes sense to me. A couple of examples of those. And um, then a couple of, Jeff asked me to talk about what are some opportunities or challenges in government. So three different um, opportunities or challenges in places from a content perspective, and then three different challenges or opportunities from a um, kind of process perspective. How do we use analytics, actually? So thinking about these five different levels, and we'll also pause so that you guys have, if you have any questions. Um, first level, descriptive analytics. You guys are all in this field. I'm sure this is fairly basic. First, just summarizing what's happening. Remarkable um, set of challenges around people just being able to do that. Um, I think a very straightforward example is the employee viewpoint survey. Um, data that we all get in our agencies. How do we even just summarize what we're getting in terms of input from OPM about the 400 plus thousand people who take that survey. Um, so that's kind of the first most basic level of just summarizing the information. There's nothing about relationships there. It's just, what are we seeing? Um, the second, I think, is probably the most interesting, which you could call relational or exploratory analysis. So you don't really know what you're looking for, but you're trying to identify patterns within the data. Um, and this is where I think data visualization and heat maps and um, you know, decision trees or relationships um, are really powerful. Um, so I don't know if folks know Gerald Ray in the Social Security Administration. Is anyone here from SSA? Um, he's done tremendous work on this incredible amount of data that they have in the Social Security Administration on the claims that they get. So he mapped with the hundreds of thousands of disability claims that people file for and the fairly limited set of judges that they have to hear those claims. He mapped the number of outcomes that are possible to achieve within the kind of range of cases. And there are 2,000 different types of outcomes that he identified. And then he used this relational exploratory mapping to try and both identify fraud. Um, so he looked at all the judges and then looked at who, which witnesses um, actually were uh, opining on the cases with specific judges. And there's a rotational order that those witnesses are supposed to go through. And he found that some judges were using some witnesses 90% of the time. So he kind of zeroed in on individual judges that maybe were, had too close of a relationship with a particular lawyer or a particular witness that was skewing cases in a particular direction in terms of a decision. And he said, you know, it's not as easy as to say, oh my god, 90%, you're supposed to be going through this rotation. That seems extreme. There's rural areas where, you know, obviously you're going to be dependent on a smaller pool of people and other extenuating circumstances that might limit that. So, but he was able to take this incredibly massive set of data and then isolate a set of um, issues where individual, some subset of the judges might have an issue around uh, witnesses and their relationships. He did a similar thing in terms of clustering decisions. He said, okay, we have all these decisions. Some decisions only surface a couple times every 10 years. So the judges actually aren't that good at evaluating them because they don't see them very often. So they started clustering cases so that if it came out to a particular decision, they uh, were gonna be given to a particular judge who could get good at that case. This reduced error rates by 50% um, because he was able to do this analysis, identify this opportunity, and then shift the workload in a way that clustered the work uh, to align to kind of human behavior in a way that uh, limited error rates. Uh, the mine safety folks at uh, Department of Labor did something similar, where they looked at all the mines and said, this was in 2010, what are all the criteria? We, we often do this probably in our Netflix, where you watch a movie and then they say, okay, maybe you'd like these movies. <laughs> so again, this is still in the second level or an exploratory or relational analysis. The question is, what do, we don't know what we're looking for, so there's a set of characteristics that because you like horror movies or you like sci-fi, you might like this other type of movie. And you're kind of constantly digging through the data to identify those set of characteristics 
to identify what uh, could lead you to this next, uh, to what you're trying to solve for. So the Department of Labor folks with the Mine Safety Commission um, were trying to figure out what is it about the mines that make them really bad, the ones that have fatalities, injuries, negligence, any number of things, whether it's a coal mine or a surface mine, uh, what are the challenges there? And so they looked at violations and they, through many rounds of analysis, used this kind of second level of trying to identify patterns and identified 50 mines that were actually the most egregious in terms of this subset of what they call their POV pattern of violations. Um, and what they did with this is then created some transparent data so that the mine operators could see what their scores were in these various regards, whether it was injuries or negligence, uh, and then worked with each of these mines in a kind of high touch. This is kind of the GAO high risk list concept. Um, and within five years, they reduced that list 98%. There's only, they could barely find one that met the criteria in 2015 um, because they had been explicit about what their criteria were on the front end um, and then transparent, I think, in sharing that information with the mine operators to actually address those issues um, and got this dramatic reduction in the whole set of things that affect mine safety. And you may have heard the, um, I don't know if anyone's here from the Department of Labor, um, but you may have heard the results about the 10 year rolling average, or I think it's actually a five year rolling average, in terms of the lowest number of fatalities um, in mines. So this kind of analysis, this exploratory relational analysis, can be incredibly powerful in terms of getting to outcomes and getting to what you're trying to achieve. The third level, um, you could call inferential or hypothesis driven. So you have a hypothesis, and the second, you know, the Netflix person who, you know, Netflix is just trying to sell you a movie, they're trying to identify the characteristics. And the third, you actually have a theory of change here, and you're trying to test it. Um, so an example of this is in EPA, um, they were trying to create a relationship between cleaning up brownfields and Superfund sites and the economic benefit to cities and uh, communities. And they undertook a study with Duke to try and uh, draw this relationship and um, were able to, over two years of kind of culling through the data, um, describe a relationship where the investment that the EPA made in a set of brownfields would return to the city two to six times the tax revenue because of the increase in property value on the basis of that cleanup. So I think the underlying um, assumption and need here was people aren't investing in brownfields or in Superfund site cleanup because they don't really see the need to, they don't really see either the downside or the potential upside. So putting together an analytic argument and story that is compelling to city leadership, obviously tax revenue, but also they did this with respect to health outcomes and expecting mothers or infants. Um, they have a statistic that 55% of the population lives within three miles of a Superfund or Brownfield site. And when they told me this, I thought, oh God, <laughs> better investigate where this is. I'm pregnant, I'm in DC. <laughs> Um, that sounds a little overwhelming. But they put together a set of facts that was motivating enough both on the downside effects of what inaction would require and then motivating enough on the upside effects and incentive to actually do something about this. Um, with really good impact, I think, in terms of motivating people to take action. So similar to the uh, Department of Labor example with the mines, you're putting information also in the hands of the people who you want to take action on this. Fourth level, um, predictive modeling. So you can see becoming more sophisticated if we started with descriptive statistics or summary information. Um, predictive modeling, I think we're all pretty familiar with the concept here. When I was at HUD, we did a lot of this around trying to reduce homelessness. You're trying to predict how many veterans, particularly on veterans homelessness, how many veterans are returning from war, uh, how many homeless people do you have on the street now, how many of them are sheltered or not, how much money do we have in terms of services, how big are our shelters, putting all these variables into our predictive modeling to see if we do X, then Y will happen at whatever rate. Um, sounds very straightforward. Obviously, the assumptions are the basis of being able to do that effectively. Uh, FEMA and others do this in terms of disaster planning. Um, there's a ton of work in this regard happening um, to try and get to analytic understanding of what, what is gonna happen. And then the last I would call, um, you could call randomized studies or causal relationship. So how do you prove kind of beyond the, there's a correlation here that, um, you know, in the EPA example, uh, investment in cleanup leads to improved property. 
But how do you do a randomized study to have a control group to really demonstrate that that's the case? And for those of you, I don't know if folks are familiar with the social behavioral sciences team, it was launched about two years ago and just recently an executive order was issued um, out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and also in collaboration with GSA um, to basically create more randomized trials in the government. And I think this is an incredibly powerful, powerful tool in terms of demonstrating the value of um, this kind of testing and this kind of analytics and the power of being able to quantify a change. So for example, and I don't know if folks have read this literature, but I think it's kind of fascinating. If you ask people to sign their name on the top of a form um, and then fill out something kind of on their honor or with good faith that they're being honest, as opposed to signing something at the bottom of a form like we might our taxes, you would get a much more honest response. Um, and so they tried this at GSA. Suppliers need to fill out a form off of which they're charged a fee. And in their form, they have to self-report their sales. And then the fee is charged off of that sales amount. <coughs> and the theory was people are under-reporting, um, not necessarily maliciously or deliberately, but they're just not being conscious about it. So they shifted that signature box to the top of the page and did a pilot with a control group and found that within a quarter, the people who signed at the top of the page um, generated a million dollars more in fees for that quarter alone, just for that quarter, than the people who signed at the bottom. Um, so a pretty powerful example of a very small administrative change that uh, they could demonstrate the monetary value over a pretty short period of time um, through this behavior change. Another example, um, there, uh, when kids are, when are going to school, there's a, what they're called the summer melt process, where they may be interested and in sign up for applications, but then by the time they get to actually enrolling, they kind of haven't done their financial aid package or haven't followed through on all the administrative processes to get there. So this social and behavioral sciences team um, instituted a process where they sent eight text messages to particularly low-income students who were applying for financial aid forms and found a 9% improvement in that group that received the text messages in terms of college enrollment. So you think about some of our mission objectives and um, these incredibly small tweaks to um, whether it's you know, a form or an action to take that could improve a college enrollment rate of 9% is pretty startling. Uh, and being able to demonstrate that, I think, is an incredibly powerful policy tool uh, or program you're working in. So these five, um, to me, I think, are used depending on circumstance, depending on need, depending on resources. Um, I would say that in terms of opportunities, working kind of from the bottom up of those five, there's three places that the performance community in general could use some help, I think, in leveraging some of these analytic capabilities. So if you think of the last two here, predictive modeling and randomized studies, that's kind of a specialty of evaluation and research groups within an organization. And often those groups, as many of you probably know, exist very separately from the performance shop that exists within an organization, which is often housed within the CFO world or um, in a part, different part of the organization structurally, but also the work itself doesn't necessarily overlap. So I think to the extent you can bring those closer together and engage the evidence world, the people who have PhDs, the people who are run, running these randomized trials, the people who are able to do the predictive modeling, closer to the performance people who are creating the strategic plans, defining strategic objectives, trying to think through measures, so that they're mutually reinforcing, you're testing that on an ongoing basis to make sure that your logic model assumptions make sense um, are right. So that's kind of the first category of opportunity, I think. The second, if you go to the third level around inferential or hypothesis-driven analytics, um, I think is around using administrative data. So we have access to this incredible amount of administrative data in the government. Uh, when I talk to some people just in terms of thinking about this talk, um, you know, I would say, well, do you ever do a sample? And they'd be like, well, why would we need to sample? We, we have all the data. <laughs> uh, whether it's, um, you know, this SSA example that I described, uh, or many places that just collect hundreds of thousands of data points around individuals or households or states or whatever it is. So I think that obviously the census is using a sample to do their work, but they have an incredible database that could be cross-referenced with other people's information. CDC has health data. 
if we leverage these administrative data sets better to understand health outcomes for public housing residents or um, understanding the environmental impact of buildings, uh, I think we can be much more powerful, not recreating surveys and research instruments, but just aligning data sets and sharing information, I think, has a lot of potential. And then if you go up to the second level around exploratory and relational data and this pattern generation, I mentioned fraud for Social Security Administration. That's a place, this is a place where enterprise risk management and integrating that into performance, I think, can be very powerful. Um, so recently, A123 tried to kind of mention this in some of our guidance. We're also talking about A11 and how to update this so that the financial community and the performance community are collaborating and integrating more in a way that's mutually reinforcing. So it's not just about, I think in the performance community we talk about how do we achieve our objectives, but it's less about what are the risks that are gonna get in the way of not being able to achieve our mission. And I think the more we're able to think holistically, in the same way we think holistically about the evidence and performance folks um, in the kind of more sophisticated end of that analytic process, we could think more holistically about the risk side of performance and, and be more effective in that respect. So the last thing I would say, and then love your thoughts on all of this, um, there are three kind of d dimensions uh, that I feel like, quite apart from the types of analysis we do or the content of that analysis, whether it's using administrative data or focused on risk or thinking about evidence, um, the kind of core challenges of actually using analytics to achieve our goals. Um, one is, I think, an obvious one that we all struggle with, which is just getting the data. The transparency of the information is frighteningly difficult. Uh, we're all bound by rules, um, whether it's laws or regulatory constraints, that limit our ability to have any visibility into what actually is available. Just a small example of this. I was talking to our chief procurement officer who manages category management and procurement for the government and run, and she was saying she can't get to understand unit costs for buying Blackberries or computers from an agency. Um, but that is uh, shrouded in legal contracts that are in the GSA schedule. You can see the ceiling, you can see what was agreed to in the contract, but you can't see actual unit costs. And for somebody who's trying to think about category management and how we do this more effectively across organizations, just with, this is just the federal government. Uh, she can't, she's the head of procurement for the government and can't get to that information. And that you know, is a much simpler version than if you think of my experience at HUD and trying to get public housing resident information and privacy issues or you know, any of the other you know, uh, students who have debt for um, financial loans. There's a lot of other complicating variables when you think about grantees or um, individuals who we give our money to beyond kind of the internal government um, population or audience. So that openness and transparency, which I think this administration has pushed a lot on, both in budget um, proposals as well as open data initiatives to try and get increase that access and transparency. The second thing is, and this is I think close to the I think performance community's heart, is outcomes. And how do you get to um, thinking about analytics, not just in terms of the kind of outputs you're collecting or a checklist of things. Um, often, I think people say, oh well, yeah, we're doing a lot of analytics because they're using that level one descriptive data and doing a lot of summary stats, often about process outputs, but not really thinking about the end result and where we're trying to get to. So in the examples that I've described, um, you know, often the inspectors in the EPA were thinking more narrowly about their piece of the environmental inspection at the Brownfields example, but not about how do you make this holistic story to the community about mobilizing people for cleanup. Or in the mine safety world, you know, you have a set of inspectors who are overwhelmed. I think it's 150,000 mines and 1,500 inspectors who have to inspect mines two to four times a year. I mean, it's just astronomical, the volume that they're dealing with. And so they're heads down, focused on, okay, do you have this, 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 and this? But there's not kind of a broader thinking about how do we think about the outcomes of these minds collectively and the interrelationships between these criteria, these variables. So getting people to that outcome, homelessness is another example that I touched on earlier. You know, I think when Sean came into HUD, there were a lot of data collection and analytics happening, um, but it wasn't necessarily geared towards analytics around what we were trying to 
get to. One quick story in this, not related to homelessness, but affordable housing. Um, when we started, we had a lot of data around how well we were utilizing public housing budgets or how well we were um, spending our money in terms of creating affordable housing. And he was asking the question, how many more people, how many more households can we house and what kind of target could we set over two years for one of our agency priority goals? So we put together 22 different programs who were creating affordable housing and shifted the measurement from how well are we utilizing our funds to create units, which is all HUD could really take control over. There were a separate set of people who were the landlords renting the units. And we shifted the measurement from creating those units to housing people in those units. So even though we didn't have control all the way through the end of that continuum, we started asking the question, okay, how many families are we actually housing? And that shifted, I think, a lot of the behavior from um, how do we you spend the money in the most efficient, proper way to how do we ensure that the turnover in these public housing units are happening efficiently? How do we make sure that we're actually getting families into these units? And actually shifted the behavior of all the different constituents, the 3,000 public housing authorities, to then increase the vacancy rate or reduce the vacancy rate. So it was at... Um, 97% and I think over two years went down to 87%. Um, sorry, I went the wrong direction. It was not, the vacancy rate was 87% and went up to 97% in terms of being fully housed. So the vacancy rate was shrinking as a proportion of the total people there. And that wasn't through uh, additional resources. That was through um, you know, this kind of emphasis on who are we housing and how are we getting the turnover uh, to happen in the right way. So if you think about um, openness of data outcomes, uh, and then the third piece of this is, um, I'm forgetting now <laughs> when I thought about this, in, in, in terms of the goals that we're trying to achieve, um, openness uh, of information outcomes we're trying to get to, and now I'm forgetting the third, but it'll come to me <laughs> because it's the magic third. Um, but that, those are, I think, our talent, that's the last piece of this, the people to actually do this. Um, how do we have the analytic capacity to actually deliver on that whole continuum that I talked about from descriptive all the way up to randomized control studies? I think we're actually fairly good on the more sophisticated end and fairly bad on the front end. So people aren't so good at summarizing information and looking at exploratory relationships between that information. And that's the skill set that I think we need more universally across program areas not housed just in some central analytic function, but embedded within the business lines that we work in, looking at this on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and really providing the data analytics to um, help inform whether or not we're achieving our mission. So happy to get some thoughts, questions, uh, reactions to any of this. Yeah? Hi, my name's Valerie. I work over at HHS. And um, I was working on some exploratory information. I was looking at the number of people that were served who um, were treated for chlamydia, which is a sexually transmitted disease. HHS, you know, has health clinics. So I was looking at that information and I wound up pulling up a, a map of uh, highest prevalency rates of this disease uh, across America. And I looked at that map and I said, oh my God, that's, those are the same states that don't have Medicaid expansion. You know, hap, uh, unhappy coincidence perhaps for the folks there. Which, but I still think that that's an important and interesting and probably not a surprising um, result of, of the way healthcare is provided in America. Great, I know this sent it to someone, went into a hole, never heard from it again. Where are there opportunities to share this information? Um, because as you say, it's not, it, it's, it's talking across ourselves um, and getting more open. So what, what opportunities are there to be able to share that kind of information? So two thoughts, and others may have ideas here. One is how you share it. So this infographic data visualization, um, we've all been on Facebook and kind of, you know, some uh, exaggerated headlines as, I couldn't believe this when I clicked here. <coughs> and then you see some infographic, I was just looking this morning, and 
you know, they had a um, set of bar charts on the attitude towards uh, letting Jews into America pre-World War II and kind of the discussion around Syrian refugees. And it was just a simple bar chart that showed most people were actually against it. And kind of what are we learning from that? And I was, you know, kind of bleary-eyed at 6.30 this morning, and I didn't even read the kind of subtext of that, and I was like, whoa, you know, that sends a very powerful message without even, you know, on a very current topic. So I think there's kind of how do you represent that in a way that's compelling, in a way that makes somebody else want to say, hey, you should check this out. The second thing I would say is, in what context that's operating. So, you know, in HHS, what are your overall strategic goals? Who cares about this? Who are the champions who, you know, care about whatever it is? I know one of the APGs at HHS is hospital, quite, you know, hospital-related infections. So is there kind of a hook where this information is already in kind of a moving work stream where there's senior leadership or conversations around it that this becomes kind of an interesting and relevant data point? You know, is it around a resource conversation, around how you're resourcing those states that aren't expanding Medicaid? Is it around some objectives you're trying to accomplish and if this kind of correlates to those? Because by itself, you know, my experience is you're just kind of drowning in information and fre frequently people, I can see how whoever you send it to was like, that's great, you know, but it doesn't kind of fit into the five or 10 things I'm trying to manage. So finding that access point, I think, um, and this is where I think getting to the connecting the performance people who do have at least that infrastructure and frame is a very useful way to attach it to something so that it becomes a part of a regular set of conversations that are happening. Thanks. Yeah. So what, I kind of have a related question, uh, kind of on the talent, uh, kind of on what the lady just said. Uh, so your example with the HUD example, uh, you know, we were using uh, an incorrect metric. Instead of, you know, landlords could have Section 8 houses available, but if they're not where the families are, it is of no good. Looking at that metric, looking at your mine example for uh, your, your talking about a percentage, I would think the proper rate, the proper metric would be a ratio because over the past three years, many mines have closed and that would bring your percentage down. Yeah. So twofold question, is there a group that can look to help people choose the right performance metric? And related to the talent, I do know within government there are pockets, but I always wonder why can't the government work better by the way, industry? Why can't the government create a group that works together to help others in government better these metrics. Yeah. So the question that the um, first question is, is there technical expertise essentially or advice that you could get from uh, government around uh, supporting what you measure or how you find those measurements? And then second, why don't we collaborate better in some more cohesive way? Um, so I, I would, even though I'm the chair of this overall, this is not the reason I'm pitching this, but the Performance Improvement Council, I don't know if you're familiar with them, uh, was created through GIPRA, the Government Performance and Results Act, and so it's fairly young, it's only been around a couple of years because it was passed the Modernization Act in 2010. Um, and we have a very small six-person team, but they actually, that's their mission, is to support people um, in thinking through analytics. And it's focused largely on the GIPRA agency priority goals, strategic reviews, and um, cross-agency priority goals. But really thinking about capability building and supporting agencies in some places in a much more high-touch way. So there's a community of people that get together every month. There's work groups that talk about law enforcement measures and you know how are those unique. Um, and there's a set of people, the woman who runs it came from the UK and was leading the delivery unit. She was the number two person there. So has a kind of broad experience from a government perspective around how you use analytics to get to mission-driven uh, goals. Uh, and that's kind of the central resource that we use. It's relatively young um, and also relatively small. Um, and that's kind of then built on a network of performance improvement officers, which are the second piece of what was modernized in the GIPRA Act in 2010. So you have an individual who reports to the deputy secretary in every agency, and we can be in that group quarterly. That's the role I played at HUD. Um, and that's kind of the node for a lot of this activity within agencies. And that kind of is a kind of narrow description of within the performance realm. There's still the evidence people, there's still the evaluation people, there's the ERM people, <laughs> you know, there's a whole set of people who are thinking about this. There's the um, chief data officer and the digital services group who's thinking about this and social media. I mean, everyone touches this, I think, in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think you have a fair point that we could be more coordinated and more effective in that respect. And the PIC, the Performance Improvement Council, is trying to do that. So I have a question that kind of melds a little bit of each of those, and that is, 
the kind of the publicizing <coughs> of performance information and what impact it has. And let me give you a kind of a, a couple of facets to that. Um, a number of folks I've talked to within government agencies say, you know, what I do, and I, I, this is for me too actually, it's kind of wonky. You know, the public doesn't really care that much about it in terms of performance and evidence about it in some ways. But what's really changed is now my boss has started to pay attention and started to ask for data and started to fear being embarrassed publicly. And so now actually performance is important in my agency. And so kind of that, that tells us perhaps that the kind of the publicly available performance information is important. And I see that kind of within the last two months, there's been something that I consider kind of new and different, which is the college scorecard. And that is we're publicizing performance information from the government, except it's not about government. It's information that's uniquely available to government from the IRS and from college and student loans and putting it together in a way that's about kind of the performance of the private sector, the colleges. And that's something where people, that's part of the general public's day-to-day -day decision making. And so my question is, are there more things that the government could or should do, not about government performance per se, but about private sector performance, where people care about it, that would kind of draw attention and get people to care more about government performance and government data? Yeah, I mean, I think the public reporting question is always a challenging one, <laughs> and finding the kind of balance of um, having people be candid and forthcoming, and this is less about private sector data and more about government data. Um, but also leveraging with a peer pressure or public pressure to kind of have more impact. <coughs> so <coughs> I think we've struggled more in the context of government data in finding a balance where you're demonstrating to the public and um, creating demand on the side of the public and to performance.gov is a good example um, that's driving change um, while also preserving the candor and richness and you know detail of the willingness of agencies but even in my experience at HUD they don't want to share with another part of HUD <laughs> much less with OMB much less with the public and so the more you press on that transparency I think the harder it is to that felt like not phase one <laughs> um, and I think <clears throat> I think about something like benchmarking, um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the benchmarking initiative, the cost agency priority goal, we're looking at five different management functions in finance, um, HR, IT, acquisitions, and real property, and looking across agencies to try and understand what's your you know, number of HR specialists per employee or um, you know, cost per square foot in terms of their desk size. And how does that compare across organizations? Even that information is kind of pulling teeth, I think, from agencies to, to get there. It does not get to your private sector question, which I think is just kind of a more sophisticated step beyond that, too. Um, the college scorecard, you could see kind of the missteps there, where there was a fairly bold statement about how we're going to do that from an administration standpoint, and then walking back from that a little bit um, to change that to uh, amassing the existing information in a kind of useful way. So I think the intent and interest is there. It's finding the kind of areas where there's opportunity, where you're adding value, um, and where you're able to do that with an objective lens and not, um, <clears throat> we're actually able to kind of further that conversation. So I guess I, my, most of my thinking has been around how do you do that with the government data and less around the private sector, but I think there are pockets of places where the private sector information could be useful in that respect. So overall, is transparency a help or a hindrance? I think overall it's a help, but I think it has to be used um, gently. Are there places in the federal government where you've seen progress in the last few years in sharing administrative uh, data across agencies and overcoming barriers to sharing data for this kind of, kind of analysis? Yeah. That's a great question, and um, I, I feel like I don't know agency-wise specific good examples. Um, I think mo inter mo most of the interesting work, I think, has happened in the state relationship with federal government. Um, and, you know, if you think like DOJ trying to share um, the impact of their grants on reducing recidivism and looking at federal data and then matching that to state data who has the recidivism rates. Um, so that you can actually see impact. The Recovery Act, I think, maybe was the best place um, where there's kind of a place of performance focus that connects the federal data to the state data in that respect. 
Um, but I, I don't, none come to mind as kind of super compelling or, you know, good examples. I don't know if others have reactions to that. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Um, there's some folks at the Census Department that um, have a lot of talent and skill sets that they share through multiple agencies. Just wondering, uh, how do you view at OPM um, uh, folks at the Census Bureau where there's sort of this core skill set and either using it, building on it, uh, collaborating with it uh, internally with the work that you do? Yeah, that's a great point, and I think um, kind of speaks to the gentleman's point earlier around how do we really leverage the strengths of the government at large. Um, we have not focused on um, kind of, we've done a lot of work on how do we bring people across the government together around IT and, you know, leverage skills in that respect, or um, we've been thinking a lot about just a general kind of uh, 15 to SES transitions, and we just started the White House Leadership Development Fellows Program where we pulled aspiring SES who are at the 15 level, who've been in government 15 or 20 years, to try and create kind of a developmental program. Data analytics is kind of a next version of some of those, where I could imagine the PIC, as I mentioned earlier, does some ambassador kind of fellowship programs, but it's at a much more junior kind of nine, GS9, 11 level. Um, and I could imagine kind of more, and I'm, I'm sure these kind of work groups exist within the community of, um, you know, whether it's detailing people to assignments or kind of more sharing of where that demand is. So for example, I was meeting with OPM yesterday and we were talking about the EDS and how we could use some of those questions to try and think through a grouping of questions that might indicate what agencies are good at performance. And none of us had any capacity to do that analytic work. But if there were a set of people, as you're describing, from census or elsewhere, um, who have these skills and are, you know, knowledgeable in this respect, and they were pooled with the demand side of this, I think that could be quite powerful. So I personally haven't done anything on it, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Just want to mention on that, there are some best practices in commercial where they do just that, where you have your performance people, your hardcore people, serve in different divisions with their groups to kind of share best practices and then go back to the central group. So there, there are examples of where that works. And it's kind of a tour of duty, yeah, limited exactly. time frame. It's been a year here show them how to do it, come back to the... Yeah, that's interesting. Um, one of the things that we have talked about with respect to data, data analytics, there's a couple of places where government particularly lags the private sector in skill sets, and data analytics is one, process improvement is another, cybersecurity, innovation, um, and figuring out how to improve some of the hiring flexibilities and do a more targeted, kind of like, I don't know if folks are familiar with the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, the PIF, um, where we pull people in from the private sector for a short kind of tour of duty time. And so we're looking at that around data analytics and could we have kind of a pool of fellows, so to speak, who are dispatched to agencies from the private sector to do that. But you could just as equivalently do it, I think, in inside government. It's just a question of, it actually could be easier and also harder, I think, to get people released from their current duties. John Van Sand, Government Publishing Office. Uh, I have a question, if you could maybe talk about at OMB. In government, we work in a system where we could have a very scientific or analytical data-based um, perspective on something, but we are controlled and operated by a political system that has oversight and responsibility for directing activities. And there, you could cite examples of things where science says one thing, but politics says a different thing. Could you discuss a little bit about that intersection and how uh, it, to, to construct or to properly set the expectations for the, the people who are doing the work and the analytics to live within sort of the reality of the system that we're in. Uh, you might have seen that at your level already. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. Um, I've struggled with it less in terms of mm -hmm. an analytic or scientific study coming to some conclusion and the political folks saying, well, we don't really want to go that direction, and more with respect to speed and um, the political folks wanting, well, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and the scientific folks saying, well, we need to validate X, Y, and Z, and it's gonna take more like six or eight months to do this. Um, an example of this, um, kind of like this, is the SSA example where you have a million, a million claims and backlog around disability claims, and you have an, a hiring of the administrative law judges that is a validated scientific process that OPM goes through with a kind of civil service equivalent exam. And so they have a fairly scientific approach to how to validate the qualifications for the set of people. 
and yet you have this business need that you could call it political, you could just call it mission, right. of a million backlogs, people waiting for disability claims and not getting paid because they can't have their cases heard. So you have the same, that tension of, we want to do this right and we want to do it with the analytic base, um, but we also need time to do that and how do you find the right balance there? So I think good political leadership is good at balancing kind of the long-term objectives of how do you build that infrastructure and um, base while also meeting some immediate need and you know whether that's an 80 percent view of you know yes we're going to agree this is imperfect my experience of government even at hud was we were trying to figure out the benefits of technical assistance in community development block grants or in you know some of the community building programs and the career staff i think even some of the political staff wanted to build a model wanted to go towards the kind of four or five level that i was describing or in predictive modeling and be very precise and accurate. And I think this is the tension where I said we need to collaborate more with the evidence groups, whereas the secretary, Sean at the time, wanted to know, you know, we're investing money in neighborhood safety programs or whatever, neighborhood stabilization programs, and what is that generating in way one versus two? And so I think ideally the kind of scientific analytic team is able to generate preliminary results or something that where there's enough of a caveat to um, give suggestive information that satisfies, I think, the directional need of the political leadership without overcommitting. I think on the second point of that around kind of political sensitivities, um, I've been a part of a lot of conversations where we just kind of agree that some information will be public because, um, you know, it, we realize either folks on the Hill could use that in a way that wouldn't be advantageous, or it wouldn't be to our advantage from a mission perspective, but the analytic process is important to maintain there. So not, there's no real answer, no. but I think a, an a accurate tension to describe. Um, Lisa, so earlier you mentioned that there is so much administrative data that the government has collected and has not been leveraged. Um, and in the government analytics program here at Hopkins, students complete a capstone project at the end of their program and they conduct an original data analysis. So I'm wondering if you have some perspective on really good data sets or policy areas or even research questions that our students could run with for those projects. Yeah, sorry, I'm not repeating the question appropriately. <laughs> so the question is where are there opportunities for a set of Hopkins students who have to do capstone projects yeah. that are looking for data analytics opportunities? Um, and I think our cap goals that are on performance.gov, the cross-agency priority goals, are a good starting point where there's a set of mission areas, that's mental health, cybersecurity, permitting, security and social um, suitability, where they're kind of big problems and we have a lot of information and a lot of need um, and happy to, <coughs> to coordinate with you um, if you have capacity um, to kind of carve out a little piece of that to do some analytic work. Another, the, the EBS is kind of a limitless, the employee viewpoint survey data set that I think provides insight. Um, you know, I just cited this example that came up yesterday where none of us had the capacity to do this analysis around validating some of the questions. Um, but I think, you know, we could talk about there's a, a lot of different possibilities there depending on the interests of the group. If I could interject for a moment, this is actually, I think, the perfect sort of situation for this forum, which is a bunch of Johns Hopkins students who are bright, energetic, focused on analytics, currently well-trained, and a bunch of folks in the room who are in government agencies, have data sets, maybe have some need for analytics. And to be able to put those two together where you can get some free energetic thinking from the Johns Hopkins students to address your current problems would be fantastic. Um, I know that Jen actually may be leaving uh, early to head to a 10 o'clock meeting if you are still. So if you catch her before she leaves, tell her you have some data on a problem. And if she has to leave, I'll be happy to take your name and information, and, and I'll share that with Jim. Yeah. Yeah, please, Alan, I'm the Social Security Administration. I just wanted to comment on that point about sharing that kind of talent. We're setting up a, 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 um, an analytic center of excellence within our uh, Office of Strategic, uh, um, uh, our strategic officer under Ruby Burrell. Um, I work for her, and, and what to your point uh, about that talent and sharing it, you know, part of it is to help different parts of the agency do uh, do you know high-level analytics work, but part of it is also to, to infuse that throughout the agency so that you've really got the talent uh, in the business process that have the ability to do so, to do this higher-level analytics work. Uh, so, and, and we're we're building that 
right within the performance. Uh, Ruby is also our performance improvement officer, yeah. and so we really are combining those things. And I, I think that's a, that's probably a good way to go. So we're just getting started with that. We are interested in, in uh, talking with uh, with some of the Hopkins students as we're building this. Uh, there may be some opportunities there. So I'd be interested. In yeah, that's great to hear, and um, we should definitely talk. I'd like to ask one more question, which is building on a, one or two of the questions in the past and, and recently about talent. Um, one of our speakers earlier in the year, uh, uh, Kristen Dalbo uh, from DHS, said the biggest challenge was not the analytics, nor the software, nor the visual presentation of data. The biggest challenge was getting people to share data. And to a certain extent, that struck me as kind of organizational psychology. How do you get people to share data? And I've heard previously also Gerald Gray from the Social Security Administration talk about it, and he's got the same problem except in reverse. You've got the evidence, you've got the results, they're very powerful. How do you get people to pay attention to them and to integrate them in their decision making and to act on them? And so my question is, is there any current capability for kind of organizational psychology to address these substantial hurdles to, to performing uh, analytics and, and to making use of them? Any capability the government can offer to agencies that may have those same challenges? Not that I'm aware of in any organized way. Um, I think we're just trying, uh, so much of that relates to the culture and environment set by the leadership. And so we're just even kind of at an assessment or diagnostic stage around helping people understand where are there pockets where people feel like it's okay to take risks by sharing data or where yeah. failure is okay. Um, so in some ways, organizational psychologists I'm sure would be very helpful, but it's also just a basic kind of dynamic between the leadership or a supervisor and you could look at some of the EVS results where many of the questions, I think, point to kind of the culture of openness or sharing and isolate a set of places. And we actually have done some of this analysis where you can see collectively across an individual component the perception of supervisors and their ability to engage um, their employees over a trend is kind of declining. And so, uh, you know, you can look back when something happens, with, for example, like with Secret Service, and look at their EVS results and see some of the leadership challenges that they had. And so I guess we're not thinking about this from kind of how do you address this problem globally across government and more about how do you isolate some diagnostic tools that could identify this challenge. Um, and it comes, it relates to data sharing, but it also relates more broadly to management. Um, and then provide some support, whether it's political leadership or um, you know, just discussion with the organization around how to support um, a more, a culture that's more, that is more open. Would you offer any advice to folks in the room who have that same problem? They can't get data from some parts of their agencies? Or, or to a Johns Hopkins students who want to learn right. how to get good at this? Yeah, the magic question. Um, <laughs> I mean, to me, this is kind of the basic human behavior of if someone's invested in a problem, what do they care about? and how do they see sharing data as helping them solve their problem. And um, <clears throat> it's less about trying to pull information from somebody else to do your thing, and more about what is that person's agenda, what is that their mission, whether it's an assistant secretary, political appointee, or even just a frontline person, you know, even a, a grantee who's putting in compliance information, what is the feedback loop to that person that's gonna make this worthwhile? So using EBS again as an example, how do you get people to see the results of that so that it's worthwhile for them to take the test, so it's worthwhile for them to share the information? Excuse me, and so OPM, for example, asks agencies to define the organizational level that they want to reveal the data. And they struggle with this issue where agencies say, well, we'll give you, you know, Department of Energy. <laughs> and they're like, well, actually, we'd like to go a layer l lower than that. And some agencies are incredibly detailed and go down to you know, a very granular unit level. But the benefit to the agency of going down to that level is all the analytic work that they can do. And I think agencies over the last eight years are realizing the power of that and are more inclined then to be more open about trying to get OPM down to that level. So I think it's just finding that incentive that will motivate people because they'll get something in return on the back end. My name's Leslie Higgins. I'm with the uh, FAA, just recent uh, moved over from uh, the Department of the Navy. I've been doing this for a long time. One of, um, one of the things uh, on, on our analytical sites is we're uh, typically pretty focused on what the data says. And um, 
but we forget the human side <laughs> and the importance of having the relationship with the people that we are getting the data from. Yeah. I found it much better if I can build a relationship with uh, John over there, uh, however we build it so that he trusts me enough to give me his data, yeah. that I'm not going to do anything to harm him with his data, because we all know we can make the data say what we want it to say. Yeah. Um, and, and they feel that um, coupled with that when you have senior leaders who are making it a safe environment, that it's okay if you're airing your dirty laundry. Um, that's really helpful for those of us that are at uh, the junior or middle level. <coughs> but it's really important as me, as the analyst, or me as the sort of go-between, depending on, on my roles, to have a relationship with you where you feel safe giving me your data, opening up your database to me so I can get in there and, and pull stuff. That uh, relationship and being able to build that is, is the key um, coupled with the downward um, push from leadership to say it's safe. I want to know what's going on and I'm not going to mess you if things are, are going bad and it's beyond your control or whatever. Uh, we've got to have both pieces, but that relationship personally with the people you're getting data is the key. Yeah. So for those of you who didn't hear, a um, woman from Na FAA, formerly Navy Analytics, uh, the safety, both of the leadership setting that tone, but also the individual relationships with people who are actually submitting data, and that trust, and individual trust is key. Did you have a question? Yeah, with your mine example, a uh, very good example. Uh, uh, what was the driver behind the improvement in safety? Was it the exposure of the data and the concern for accountability? Uh, was it uh, that people just wanted to do the right thing, a combination thereof? And then talk to uh, how best to approach uh, your leadership so that the data is, in fact, going to lead to positive outcomes. Yeah. My understanding is that they, it was engaging the mine operators so that they actually had visibility into the violations. So previously, I think it was more of an um, external process that kind of then they left and they said, okay, here's what's wrong, and now here's what's wrong again. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have an ongoing understanding or visibility or ownership, really, of this is something I can do something about. And I think that was actually a database and tool that they could access, that they could see maybe also relative to their peers, that they were the 1% of minds that were an exception in some of these cases. So it was a norms changing, you know, it's not okay to have X number of fatalities or injuries or whatever the um, issues were. An example of this that um, when I was in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg had done these health inspections at restaurants and then changed that to this grading system so that everyone can see, and you guys probably have seen this in the restaurants, if you got an A or B and these fancy restaurants got like a B and then suddenly there's on their door a B and people think, oh, I wonder what the issue is here and <laughs> they had salmonella or something. And so the, the, coming back to your point about transparency, I think the value of creating ownership, this wasn't just a back, you know, oh yeah, health inspectors are coming and they're going to check and see if we have any evidence of mice. This is a very public, um, you know, something that actually I feel invested in because I care about my reputation as a restaurant. So if you're going to make me care about that, you know, by making this more visible, I think it gets to the second part of your question, I think, around how do you get the actors to take notice, not just from a morality argument, which would be the Brownfield example, like, oh yeah, this would be good for the health of the population, but the tax revenue argument, we actually really need to do this. Um, so that's really important. Mm -hmm. Lisa, in the private sector, uh, let's pretend a, a company that's reporting its earnings and financial results, we recognize the company has kind of a conflict of interest and may want to appear itself to be more successful than it is, and there's a structure around that. There are independent standards, so there's kind of a, a community of accountants that develop the generally accepted accounting principles, and there are auditors, that's the whole CPA industry, and then there are kind of the Wall Street analysts who say, you know, you may have grown your, your revenue or your profit by 5%, but my target for you was 8%, and so you really fell short of expectations. So there's this kind of whole independent structure around performance reporting in the private sector that doesn't really exist in government. And so the question is kind of, as, as we've heard here, not surprisingly, it's possible to make the data say anything you want it to say. If we're trying to kind of think about ways to use transparency, how do we get people to trust the performance data that government presents about its own activities? Well, I guess first you have to see it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're as close to any, as anyone to performance.gov, and you don't really see it. 
you see a set of goals in the brownfield example. I talked to the woman who runs the program, and I said, well, what's your goal in terms of cleaning up brownfields? And she said, well, I think it's 18,600 brownfields cleaned up in the next two years. And I was like, okay, how many <laughs> brownfields are there? <laughs> you know, like it doesn't make any sense um, unless you have the context of the total. And we basically got to a point where I said, okay, you're cleaning up three or four percent of brownfields every two years. She said, yeah, I guess that's how. But it didn't, there was no context. And then there's no, nothing on our website. And this is, I think, something we did a good job of several years ago when we started the Agency Priority Goals, but have done less well at now showing some trend line. So Treasury, for example, moved from um, you know, manual paper processing of tax benefits and other earned income tax credits to an electronic processing of those benefits. And they saved $100 million every year over the last five years. And you can see a trajectory. They were declining a few percent, I think it was 5% a year. And then they made it an agency priority goal. Neil Wolin, who was the deputy secretary at the time, got behind this. They had a data-driven review. They you know, set up relationships with um, electronic uh, providers to issue checks electronically to people, and you see this dramatic drop. So if you have the data and you see that, and you're the public on performance.gov or wherever else you're gonna see it, then you feel invested, you feel mm -hmm. you understand what's going on. When you see these kind of cryptic, we're gonna do X and here's a total, or it doesn't relate to what you're actually, the universe of what you're talking about, it's very hard to engage, and there's no data behind that. So I think it's a kind of combination of messaging and using simple language and being using English, um, providing the data um, to make that useful, and then being responsive on topics that actually the public cares about. It's not just about internal milestones or kind of outputs, but something that people feel, you know, I think part of the reason our HUD homeless veterans goal was very powerful is because we said we're going to end veterans homelessness in five years. So that's simple, it's something people care about, it's outcome oriented. And then we actually had data annually to show that. So I think that combination kind of generated accountability around that that actually was very meaningful. Let me ask one more question on that particular topic. So with that example, in homeless veterans, you, as you suggest, you need to know, well, how many veterans have we housed, but you also need to know the top line, the context. How many homeless veterans are there out there? Yeah. And essentially to kind of have a credible way of gathering that universe of information the government may not have now. Do you see that as kind of an increasing priority, decreasing priority, or about the same, to kind of gather information about the world at large so we can kind of understand where the, the context is for the government activities? Increasing priority. I mean, I think the, that context and that baseline, you can't, you can't get there without that. So um, I think in places where who are trying to create this accountability and set these goals, I would say it's increasing. Okay, we actually are about running out of time. So I want to thank you very much for joining us, Lisa. Um, I found this fascinating, and uh, we appreciate your service to the public. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank and this you. is a uh, small photo of our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question. You're expecting a boy or a girl? Girl. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has any uh, name ideas, uh, feel free to let me know. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.